honored to welcome the University of Denver alum, Professor Ndebele, um, to the Murray College of Education. Professor Ndebele holds a PhD in creative writing from DU, as well as a master's degree in English literature from Cambridge University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Philosophy, philosophy from the former University of Botswana um, and uh, Swaziland. His leadership experiences have spanned higher education institutions and organizations, um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, cultural organizations, foundations, and uh, ministerial commissions, as well as being a highly respected commentator on a range of public issues in South Africa and abroad. Uh, a prominent academic, Professor Ndebele, currently serves as Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg and the Chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. We'll be interested to hear about his role as Chancellor, as I, I learned two minutes ago, uh, that, that this role is very different, and uh, we're anxious to hear about that, especially we've got a lot of higher ed uh, scholars in the room. Another, uh, among other notable positions, he was the Vice Chancellor at the University of Cape Town, um, Vice Chancellor of the University of the North, Vice Rector of the University of the Western Cape. He's also been awarded a number of honorary doctorates in literature from universities in the UK and the US, the Netherlands, Japan, and South Africa. What's amazing about you and what we find um, most seminal to your work is your work as an author. Um, he's been published in literary and scholarly journals and anthologies in South Africa, the United States, and Europe. Um, his innovative novel, The Cry of Winnie Mandela, was published to critical acclaim. An earlier publication, Fools and Other Stories, won the Noma Award, Africa's highest literary award. Uh, for the best book published on the continent in 1984, which is amazing and, and very impressive. Uh, he's known as a thoughtful commentator on a range of contemporary public issues in South Africa, as reflected in two books of essays, um, Rediscovery of the Ordinary and Fine Lines from the Box. This uh, amazing um, career gives him a unique perspective and unique insight into the complexities of the South African experience, and hopefully, um, some insight into what we're experiencing in our own country. So we're happy and honored to have him uh, sharing those experiences today. So please join me in welcoming <coughs> Professor Indabelli. So um, you have held many, many important positions in higher education. We've got a bunch of higher ed scholars uh, in this room. So. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your career path? I'd love to ex for you to explain the difference in uh, your current role as well as your role as vice chancellor. Um, and then um, talk to us a little bit about the choices that you made and how those influenced your ultimate positions. Okay. Thank you very much. Firstly, I'm um, greatly honored to have been invited back to my alma mater. Um, the last time I was a, a student here, I graduated in, in 1983. That's, uh, I think, 35 years ago or something. And, uh, but I was honored to return here uh, in 2008 uh, to be for the honor of an honorary doctorate at DU, which is very special for me because it came from my alma mater. Um, where do I start? I, I think first uh, the, to say something about the, the chancellorship currently. So actually the, the chancellorship that I hold is very different from the DU one. Uh, it's a ceremonial position rather than an executive position. And that's the kind of British model uh, where you can have a Prince Charles as a chancellor of some institution. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's really an, an honorary position that I visit. I'm not always on campus. I, I, I always tell them that uh, it, it's, it's a position 
air of honor with little authority at all. <laughs> but but when you when you visit the campus, everybody wants you to feel very important. <laughs> That's great. The the vice chancellorship is the executive one, uh, which in the United States we call the, the president, you know, of the, of the university. So these things change from place to place. My journey has been a long one. I think that uh, I have experienced different educational environments. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting, uh, coming from South Africa, as you uh, will assume some knowledge, I don't know how much, but people can, can ask me to explain further. But South Africa was a is deeply uh, divided country, racially. And this has been the case since the times of the conquest of uh, South Africa by first the Dutch and then and then the English, and everything got you know finally settled. Uh, occupation uh, from around uh, 150 years ago, and uh, and of course uh, colonialists go around the world looking for only one thing. Uh, material resources, gold, diamonds, uh, new, uh, whatever, uh, iron ore, plutonium, plutonium and, and, and everything. And South Africa had a lot of all of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a, a prized possession from those people. But uh, you need people to do the work uh, for you. So you, part of the reason is you make the indigenous help inhabitants be the one to do the work and the best thing to, to do is to transform them from uh, uh, agriculturalists uh, and turn them into labor uh, into the modern labor system uh, and they go there screaming because they don't really want they want to get on with their own lives as they always have for hundreds of years before uh, so the the Everyone then became a laborer, a kid with the men, and they had to travel vast distances to go to work uh, in the Johannesburg uh, area where all the gold mining was happening, and then uh, in other parts of the country as, as service providers to the administrative systems in, in, in various ways. So there was a massive movement of South Africans across the whole Southern African continent. Some of them came all the way from uh, Zambia, Malawi, you know, in other words, the entire Southern African region was galvanized by it. We, over time, we became totally different people from who we were, and uh, learning to, to accept a lot of that, and, and uh, to find a, a place in the sun uh, from, from that whole history. So, what it means then, politically, uh, the racial system was then put fun, fun, uh, fundamentally in place. Uh, black people this side, white people this side. Black people in schools, white people in schools. And, and uh, uh, black people, no restaurants, and you have to figure out how to, to eat if you went into town, and no entertainment facilities. Black residential areas, white residential areas, everything was kind of divided systematically in that, in that kind of so what it means then is that there was therefore an education for 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 black people who are not allowed to go beyond certain levels of education because their job historically was to become uh, workers so and to service the, the, the system and that is how it was for a very long time in the nine, 1948 which was the time that I was born. The, the Afrikaner Nationalist Party won the elections, and that's the one that really drove what came to be known as apartheid. So apartheid became formal and, and stringent, stringently applied in those days. What was also done, this has implications for some of the educational questions of education that might come, is that uh, separate states, artificial states, were created for each ethnic group. 
So I told us one for the Zulus, one for the Sutus, one for the Zwanas, another one for the Bendas, another one for the Zwanas. It's an elaborate uh, system of trying to divide people and then at the same time <coughs> take advantage of, of them. Now, so uh, in 1953 or two or thereabout, they came up with this what they call Bantu education, that is education for black people. So you, you, there are certain things that you are not allowed to learn, certain books you are not supposed to read, and, and all that. Now that's when my journey partly begins, because I grew up in that system, but uh, many, many parents who were middle class, who had middle class uh, aspirations like my parents, few who were black. My father was a teacher, and, and my mother was a nurse. So, I mean, we were, we were quite privileged in our community. <coughs> and uh, they were, they had a, this had implications that I explore in my creative writing, uh, growing up as a, as a young boy uh, who was privileged. And uh, when everybody else had walked bare, bare, barefooted, I had shoes. And uh, I didn't like having shoes because <laughs> I liked to look like everyone else. Right. Uh, but it was that kind of kind of thing. So uh, the, the many of such parents then decided they didn't want to have anything to do like it, with budget education because it limits the possibilities of their children's development. So my parents decided by sending you off to Swaziland, which has a British. Uh, uh, Colony uh, possession, and uh, another one was Lesotho, and another one was Botswana. So you remember the university I went to was owned by these three countries: Botswana, Swaziland, Botswana, and, and Lesotho, and it was jointly run by them. So they sent you when you were this was and when, when was, you were was, uh, ready for college or before no, that? Before then, okay. To do the to finish the primary school okay. uh, in Swaziland. <coughs> which was nice to be you know, free in a free country, and uh, you didn't have to uh, explain who you were and why you were, where, where you were, and what, what you were doing. And all that. So it was, we, 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 we studied towards a, a, a British a Cambridge Overseas School Certificate, uh, which was very much predominant across the, across the continent, where the British uh, were. Then when I graduated, finished my primary school, I went into the high school, and then in Swaziland, and then uh, for my university education, it was impossible for me to have to go back to South Africa, to a system uh, that I had run away from, that my parents had taken me away from. So the only way was to go to this university, which was owned by the three countries, which, which is, was based in its campus, main campus was in Rome, at the town of Roma, in Lesotho, and, and that's where I spent some of the most glorious four years in my life. Now, it's a, a little bit important to talk about this a little bit more because uh, the University of Botswana in Lesotho in Swaziland was a, a, an independent uh, uh, campus, uh, very in, uh, diverse. The, the professors came from uh, America, America, USA, <coughs> Canadians, British, Kenyans, Zimbabweans, and, and all over the world. It was, a, it was wonderful to be there because remember, in, across the border in South Africa, there were only white, were white, white universities and then black universities. And then it, education was not free from that point of view because you are not free to teach whatever you want to teach, to hire whoever you want to hire. Uh, you know, to research whatever you want to research. It, it was uh, controlled you know, by, by the state. And, and not only that, there were the university system in South Africa was divided according to languages. So there would be English speaking universities, African speaking universities, and so on and so forth. And, and so that, the pursuit therefore was an experience of a totally liberal, free education that we enjoyed reading any books and anything that you could think of uh, was, was available to. So it was a period of growth uh, for, for all of us. 
uh, perhaps more, more, more significantly uh, is where uh, uh, my, my, I met my life partner uh, uh, in, in the suit when we, we got married and met and, and all that. And now we have grandchildren. And so so um, it was a wonderful experience in many ways, including that one. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, it, it was really a great place to be. Then uh, I went to Cambridge and got the, the masters and, and then DU. And so it's been a, a, a long journey, uh, experiencing different cultures and different culture, countries. I don't know how, how, where you want, how far you wanted to go at this point. Uh, and maybe this is the first segment, or should I continue? Well, I'm I forgot I was up here, I was so uh, that's right, I need to do my job. Uh, so, um, your, your intent, is my understanding, is that you wanted to be a writer. Um, is that true? That is true. And um, it feels like, uh, and you tell me and you tell us, that your passion for writing um, and telling the story and, and influencing others, tell me how that morphed into moving into higher education. Okay. So where, 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 I've, where I've got to this point is that uh, I've got my degrees and everything. But I haven't started working yet, mm -hmm. so I guess that's a, it's a good place to, to sort of switch over. My, uh, my, uh, uh, I, 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 I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon when you grow up in a family, children imprint, so they look at what is around, and, uh, and some things look like they're worth copying, and others, you learn fears, and you learn you know, everything. Clearly, I was, I was fascinated by the fact that my father uh, was a playwright. He, 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 published, he, he wrote a play which became the first ever published play in the Zulu language. Uh, it was published in 1941, and, uh, and this uh, was prescribed uh, text in some of the, the universities. Now, uh, uh, it's a wonderful thing for a child to hear. And the good thing about it is that uh, the, he, he was a very progressive, modern thinking person. So there were books in my home uh, on literature, poetry, uh, art, particularly for modern art. Uh, there was a, there were, he, he loved classical music and jazz, so I remember when he became an inspector of schools, uh, he, I used to, we used to wake up early and, uh, and we would be here from our bedroom, his, his typewriter, uh, those days, the old typewriters, and clicking away very early and into the background of, of classical music. And those those kinds of things they stay in the mind of a of a child. Uh, so part part of the of my interest in reading and literature and education had, had to do with with uh, that kind of upbringing. On the other side, my my mother was a nurse, a very warm, generous, kind-hearted uh, person uh, from whom I, I must have picked up. Uh, what it feels like to be compassionate and, and empathetic and, uh, and uh, generous and, and, and open to other people and, and certainly be open to people without regard to, to class and race and, and all those things because all sorts of people came into my house and we were welcomed by my mother and so that, that, that also goes a long way. So I would say then that uh, my, 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 uh, my writing inclinations and my interest in education sort of came out of the same kind of family experience uh, that I, I grew up in. And uh, I started writing poetry in my language, in Zulu, 
in, in, in about 15, and, and they used to, my father used to work far away and, and come back home for, for weekends. So I would write these poems and put them on the table at night on the day that I knew he would be returning, hoping he would read them in the morning mm -hmm. uh, when he came. So that's how, that's how, that's how it, it, it began. And uh, I began to publish in my school uh, magazine. Uh, and then before I even went to high school, to, to the university, I had, I had my face first breakthrough and published a poem in a, a public magazine, which was called Cla Classic Magazine, uh, which was partly edited by the famous Nadine Godimo, uh, th those days. And um, some famous writers like Ned Nakasa, Louis Nkosi, it was uh, wonderful for a, a young writer to be featured in public in publications with such uh, great writers. Uh, so that was a bit before I went to to high to, high, to university uh, in Lesotho. So my career began sort of along those lines, and so probably is no mistake that I, I went into higher education, and then uh, and then work, write whenever I had time to write. But sometimes not only when I had time to write, but I had to create the time, right? I published The Cry of William Mandela when I was thick in the midst of the, uh, the president of the University of Cape Town. A very complex, challenging novel, uh, but I was able to put it off somehow because sometimes when you really want, when, when the book wants to come out, it wants to. But interestingly, I also, I also observed that I used to, writing was uh, like a kind of a, a valve to let off pressure. Uh, sometimes uh, when uh, there was a very difficult thing going on on campus, uh, protests and workers, sometimes students and so on, uh, that's probably when I, I wrote some of the best parts of the cry of Nino Mandela. Uh, uh, but in, in a sense, uh, writing, writing uh, gets you out of it, but also gives you a certain kind of perspective because when you, you go back and uh, you, you're able to apply, bring to the business of running an institution the complexities of, of, uh, of uh, uh, interacting with people. So even if the people are in uh, a sort of fictional context, what, help, what happens in the fiction uh, can be applied to the reality you become far less, uh, far less judgmental of, uh, of people making demands. You, you want to understand better where they are coming from, and you want to, you, you want to avoid uh, uh, the big stick, uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't take, it often creates more problems, you know, than so, but it also means uh, having a great deal of patience until something gets sorted out. And uh, so, uh, uh, it's, so it's been that kind, that kind of journey. One part of it is perhaps getting closer and closer to, to the higher education itself, is that I began to teach at the University of Botswana Institute of Southern after my master's. In, in Cambridge, which was a wonderful time to be at the University of Cambridge and being taught by some of the professors that whose books you were, you were reading and all that, uh, you know, to, to spot uh, the famous Levis uh, cutting his lawn uh, somewhere was, was wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and I then began to teach uh, African literature uh, at the University of Botswana Institute in Swaziland. It was a very progressive curriculum because in South Africa, teaching African writers like Achebe, Kolesh Chuyenka, Ezekiel Mustafa, was anathema. 
and because they were sort of regarded as noble revolutionary people that would, that would spoil the minds of, of our blacks, you know, and, 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 that, and that kind of thing. And, but there we, there, there, there we were. So Lesotho had a liberating effect on what was possible for, for me to teach, to extend the curriculum. But there were already battles at the time that I was teaching, that coincided with the, the anti-colonial struggles across the whole continent, that the, those that were conquered 150 years ago wanted to get their land back. And so in the 1960s, um, partly beginning from the 50s with the independence of Ghana in 1957, other countries became became independent and uh, throwing out the British. They, they were already thrown out of India uh, by, by that time with Mahatma uh, Gandhi. And then other, other countries followed a, 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 across in a wave uh, across the, the continent. South Africa was, of course, we were the last ones to finally get our, our independence. In, 19, in 1994, but it's been a long struggle. So the relevance of this is that uh, writers, you may have heard of uh, Nguki Wathiongo, the Kenyan uh, writer, uh, who was one of the greatest writers of the African continent, had, has a, was a, a grad, was a, a, a young lab, lecturer or professor at the University of Nairobi already started this movement towards uh, uh, changing the curriculum. Say, why should the African child uh, be, be, be brought up on a, on a diet of uh, Charles Dickens and uh, Shakespeare and all those people? Why? So there were big debates uh, already happening at the time. My university was right at the forefront of all that because immediately the debate began, the curriculum start, started to change uh, to make it much more relevant to the African environment. This, this had, had no, nothing to do with the validity or otherwise of English. Uh, it, it was purely a political, historical situation which, in which you still managed to maintain and retain the value of what's best wherever it, it comes from in the world. So we, 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 we enabled that for our students to broaden their imaginative compass beyond English literature. We even begin, began to study uh, uh, American and, and, uh, and, and African American, the, uh, the, uh, the native son was it was prescribed on our it, it was a mind blowing novel uh, that that uh, we, we were able to read uh, in Lesotho far away Lesotho the sort of small corner of the world and and uh, some <laughs> some Faulkner and some uh, 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 the the comedian the, the two Huckleberry mm -hmm. uh, yes Mark Twain Mark Twain and uh, the, so that, that was very formative. All these things took very slow to get to South Africa, of course. Uh, so by the time South Africa changed, about four years before, before 1994, uh, there was already a lot of agitation within South Africa for changing the schooling system, changing the university system, changing the, the reading lists you know, on campus. All these things, right? so it, it, you can see it's been a long journey. Let me then perhaps to conclude this segment. When I finally get back to, got back to South Africa, after 20 years, by the way, I spent 20 years in exile in Lesotho because I couldn't go back. I knew that uh, when I graduated, my parents told me that the security Police were asking uh, about me, 
and it meant that if I will return, I would certainly, you know, end up in some prison. I, I wouldn't want to do that. And I stayed in Lesotho for 20 years until uh, I was, a, until a year after Nelson Mandela was released, then South Africans began to stream at home. So here is then my trajectory at that point. I taught at the University of Botswana, Lesotho, and so on. When I came back home, I taught at one of the best universities in, uh, in, this, in South Africa, the University of the Great Waters in, in, in Johannesburg. I didn't like Johann, that university very much, not because I didn't like the people or anything, but I had a, I, I, when I got back there, I couldn't, I couldn't stand there. It's, it's, it felt like I had never left South Africa, despite the fact that these were white, lib so they were white liberal. So there's a limitations to, to the liberal, uh, to the liberal sensibility, uh, which which uh, uh, feels that uh, it is it, it is at the top of of the sensibility of, of freedom, but in fact uh, we're not we're fairly had, had a lesser consciousness of their own limitations. And, and, and I felt that having traveled the world, I couldn't stand the parochialism uh, of a certain kind of thinking uh, from predominantly uh, the white uh, colleagues here on, on campus. It was just too, co too constricting. Uh, uh, I, I was then attracted to when working at the University of the Western Cape, mm -hmm. which, which got to be known as the, the People's University. The, the experimentation with teaching, with pedagogy, with uh, curriculum, books, and everything was extensive across the continent, across the campus. It was a campus whose, whose business was, what is it going to look like to live in a different country? So it was a sort of root uh, thing, changing the attitude, the perspective of teaching law, teaching theology, teaching literature, teaching education, philosophy, sociology, everything was up for grabs. And so it was, it was wonderful to be back there and be part of this. And uh, unfortunately, that was my first step of uh, moving away from the classroom, because <laughs> I became the, the deputy uh, president uh, in, responsible for, for student affairs. Uh, to, so, so began my journey of uh, conflict between when am I going to write, when am I, uh, as opposed to getting <coughs> in the means of writing. But it was a wonderful campus to be. I've never regretted that South Africa was changing. The, most of the people that became uh, ministers in the Mandela's government, many of them came from the University of the Western Cape. The, the president of the University of the Western Cape, uh, Professor Jay Scarver, became the, the director general in Nelson Mandela's office. So, he, he, he began to work with Mandela from where go, and leaving, leaving his campus, which he had done so much work to, to build. A lot of others these days, uh, the, the, some of the finance ministers, the, the Pravin Gordon, and, and a lot of others who, who occupied various portfolios. So the campus was kind of denuded of, of talent. Uh, at, very quickly, it was a very disruptive effect on, on the campus. And, uh, but I didn't stay long there either, because there was another campus where Nelson Mandela happened to be his chancellor in this kind of way. Uh, I, I became the, 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 vice, uh, the vice chancellor, the, the, the president, for four years. It was the most difficult campus because most of the 
uh, that, that campus <coughs> had been occupied, probably the only of his experience of his kind in the world, had been occupied by the South African National Defense Force, the soldiers, for about five years because they wanted to repress <coughs> student activism. So it was a very traumatized campus. And uh, so becoming its, its president, uh, one had to contend with, with this and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of activist students you know, on campus. Well, uh, again, I suppose uh, my, my perspective towards uh, management of such situations uh, helped a great deal because now, uh, during my, my day, the, one of the, uh, we have very, trouble, very troublesome student leaders, politically. Uh, but uh, one of the one of the best ones, not as troublesome in, in, in a disruptive kind of way, but, but also intellectually engaging. Mm -hmm. Today he is the, the premier of uh, or what you might call the governor of, of the of the province of Houting. Wow. So I mean it's uh, ma marvelous. So, some of these these are some of the last things that come out of it. Use, use his powers for good. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Disrupted that's, my exa life. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then, uh, then, then uh, I, uh, I spent after that I spent uh, two years at the Ford Foundation as a writer in residence, which gave me the chance to begin writing the cry of William Mandela. And then when I went back, uh, it was to be the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, which is from where, where I, I retired. So you can see then, I've, I've, I've worked in a, in a, in a, com a campus with an independent country. Then I worked in a, one that was a liberal, liberal English-speaking orientation in, a, in Johannesburg. Then I moved to uh, the Western Cape, where you have the predominance of what are called colored people, which are people of mixed with descent. So the University of Western Cape was predominantly colored in that sense, mm -hmm. with a very strong uh, activist tradition uh, in it. Then I went to the University of the North, a very deprived you know, campus, and I ended up with a uh, the one, the most number one campus, you know, in in in, in Africa, it continues to be today, with with everything that I could dream of, until I said to myself, "What am I doing here? They've got everything." But it turned out that uh, it never works that way. Every every institution, wherever it's located, always needs something. To be to be beyond where it is, so so Harvard never has enough money, <laughs> and everybody never has enough money. But it, it just goes according to what is the chance. Soon I got I got a hang of, of that, and that if you want to stay at a certain level, then you've got to to uh, work at, at that level. And, and, and that goes with, with resources uh, that have, have to be found and, and to stay competitive. So, uh, so I've had this trajectory, therefore, that is very varied and, and, uh, and has been deeply enriching uh, for me and my family. That's great. Wow. Powerful. Um, you've, you've spoken a little bit about the role that education has played um, in, uh, in affecting social change. Um, and a little bit for you, um, we talked a little bit about higher education, etc. cetera. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what you feel like higher education's role and um, responsibility is in conflicted areas, conflicted um, uh, times of social change? Mm -hmm. Um, firstly, in this, this part, starting with Lesotho, um, when I was teaching in Lesotho, I discovered that one of the most important 
the things that the university did was uh, to be uh, innovative in an area of uh, creating opportunities for for women, but in particular uh, in uh, what they call prior prior learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so they started a program called. Uh, by the way, what is the name of that? Uh, for mature age entry. The, 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 the mature age entry. It's like a non-traditional non student. Non-traditional student, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, is, um, it was amazing because you remember in the suit they send, they send there, uh, most men were always away in the mines. Mm -hmm. Or if they are not in the mines, they are up in the mountains, <coughs> taking care of cattle and, and so on. The women were, were, were generally left you know, at home. This was an enormous opportunity for them to go to university mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and get degrees and, and able to enhance their earning capacity. Uh, uh, so I would say that uh, in that particular instance, uh, the university made a tremendous contribution to, to the gender uh, empowerment uh, in, in this country. You can't, it's not necessarily a conflict uh, a, a situation, but, but nevertheless an area of need. So a, um, providing an opportunity, uh, yes. being responsive to the community, yes. um, maybe going outside of what is traditional. Yes. Um, all aspects of what uh, that particular program would allow. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, back in the South African context, where there would have been a lot, there was a lot of conflict. Uh, but it being the duty of universities to to open up the, the educational environment to all South Africans. So we have to break break the barriers of uh, of tribe, of race, uh, ethnicity, and and and. Uh, class and all those things. Uh, precisely because the universities were, were divided officially uh, according to those areas. So it was it was important for each and every institution to break through that wall. And uh, some have done done them on the road faster than others. I think the, the African speaking universities were uh, been found it very difficult because they were the ones, they were the ones in power and, and they, were, they were the ones who had developed their language and everything they, 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 they were responsible for the party were found it very very difficult to start uh, letting in uh, black students uh, and then once they had let them in they still insisted that they had to learn Afrikaans before they uh, which was very difficult so there's been a battle across the higher education system to, to make the university available to everyone who has ability, regardless of their cultural background and their linguistic background. And that uh, uh, since these universities, all universities are, are public institutions. So the public institutions receive state, state they receive our, our taxes, you know, to, to run the way they do. So they better open up to, to everyone. So the demand on, on all universities since uh, 1994 during the, starting with the Mandela government, was to open up all these public institutions. Well, it, it's gone well, generally, for public institutions, but uh, uh, rightly so. It has also filtered down to, to private universities because uh, constitutionally, you can't uh, uh, exclude people or on the grounds of, of race, color, ethnicity, and cultural, cultural background. So I think that uh, when we, the, the system has done reasonably well, but not perfect at the moment, but uh, where in, 19, in 1994, we, we had about uh, 186,000 Black people in the in the schooling system, in the higher education system, close to a million now uh, since since 1994. That's a tremendous uh, 
That means that doesn't mean they have no physical struggles, because it is one thing to to uh, uh, create opportunities for for people. It it is another to prepare them to set them up for failure. So you can kind of go all over the place saying you you got to get people from the poor communities uh, and then you put them in and then they they don't make it. Uh, so all, all universities had to struggle with that. Uh, once you have got them in there, how do you make it possible for them to qualify uh, to the same level as, as everyone, get the best degree, but also make sure that in doing they are able to succeed uh, like everyone. So it means that you know, we all have to devise different kinds of ways uh, to make that, that possible. The University of Cape Town Design, devise the program, uh, a test that is now used nationally to test uh, uh, students for, for academic potential. So now it's become a sort of standard thing to be applied that people write these tests to test if they, uh, they have the potential to succeed. So that means that uh, in, uh, uh, against the a system of criteria that also becomes factored in in deciding whether to uh, uh, admit someone, you know, or not, and uh, it's worked very effectively. Typically, some of those uh, the, uh, the trend has been that those that are, are admitted on such criteria will struggle in the first two years, but the trend is that in the third and the fourth they outperformed those that came in normally. Uh, so it, it means that uh, it, it worked very well. And uh, some of the things that we've had to consider was if you if you are you get a C grade student in a very depressed area, chances are that you, you are the best in the area. So uh, our admissions procedures UCT allowed us to have slots for such, for such students. And an uh, uh, overwhelming percentage of them uh, outperformed the rest uh, in, the, in the third and fourth years. Uh, so we, it means that uh, we, it, it was pretty good to have done that. Uh, th those, those admission procedures have become far more standard now. But the schooling system is still struggling. So the, the, the biggest challenge for South Africa now is uh, how do you, do you uh, improve <coughs> the quality of basic education so that you don't have to make all these adjustments uh, at, at, the high, at the higher level at university. But it takes a lot of time. Uh, to, to, to get there. We have uh, some of the, the, the big, st st from a strategic point of view, we have severe shortage of good teachers, severe shortage of nurses, uh, severe shortage of doctors and engineers and everything. The universities can only do so much to, to, to bridge that, that gap. But the, the schooling system has got to be good universally across wherever you are in the country so that the universities can focus on on that. From the point of view of uh, uh, one of the things that the universities played a big role in was uh, again from the point of view of conflict. Uh, just before Nelson Mandela took over power, uh, you remember that uh, South Africa uh, was uh, uh, got its, in, its independence by ne negotiation. So we avoided the traumas of war and all that. For a long time then, before, before 1994, for about three or four years, I mean, you could say the whole country was a kind of open seminar room <coughs> because people were finding one another for the first time the principle of negotiating uh, 
trying to understand the other person's point of view. Many uh, who conducted, who led these discussions were coming from the universities uh, and the research was, was being done from in the universities. Uh, so the, the universities played a very, very important role in contributing uh, to the negotiation process and uh, through pro providing actual expertise in, in the drawing of the constitutions, for example, and, and, and uh, all those in, in, in the areas of science. So the universities have played a very big role uh, in facilitating a fundamental change uh, in South Africa. I want to back up one more question and then I'll open it up. One of the similar uh, situations that we face uh, is the lack of resources, particularly in rural communities. We've lived in Colorado long enough to know the uh, front range we have from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, but the rest of our state is very rural. Our uh, schools uh, are now in many rural communities going to four days a week as opposed to their um, you know, suburban and metro area counterparts that are that are uh, um, five days a week of school. Um, you know, our approach in the college has been that, that we can do better and we must do better. Uh, the idea of attracting talent, as you uh, talked about, of nurses and teachers and and to those kinds of roles into these uh, more. Uh, less well-resourced areas has been a challenge for us. Uh, we'd like to understand what the role of a university can do uh, to help support communities that are faced with those types of shortages because we are we're losing talent in those uh, students that aren't able to, uh, to leave or that aren't coming back uh, to serve their communities. Any advice in that space? I don't know what the demographic movements are in the United States, but in, in South Africa, uh, the, the shift is decisively, people are moving from the rural areas towards the cities in huge numbers, and I don't think that this world is about to stop. Um, so there's a question of living with their reality, and then having to decide what, what uh, minimum kinds of interventions are possible to you know, keep a reasonable quality of life for people in the rural areas who in a sense have, have, have to make a commitment that this is where they belong. And then if they, if they feel that if they made this commitment to, to belong there, then what do you do to, to change the manner in which you allocate resources uh, at state level to create a quality of, of life in those places where people have decided they want land, want to move, but, but they're rural. So what is the best way of uh, keeping their lives uh, uh, afford, afford, have an affordable and decent, decent lifestyle? It has not been easy. The so one example I can give is from the medical, we have a medical faculty at the University of Cape Town. The government took, uh, adopted a policy that uh, once a, a, a it's, it's a six year program to qualify to be a doctor, and they add another, another year uh, of service uh, to the community service. Uh, so they spend that year, they, uh, they can be sent anywhere uh, to go and, and provide medical services and come back uh, to, to, to graduate. The reaction to, to, that, to that has been mixed. Uh, uh, I think that uh, more, most uh, young potential doctors uh, find life in the, in the, in the rural areas difficult. And, and, the, and the cases, the medical cases, are particularly challenging. Uh, so, which means that if that is the case, uh, how, how does this, the, the state, uh, the Ministry of Health or whatever, support the education of future doctors? 
and not leave them there as if they are already qualified doctors. They, they still need a tremendous amount of support, uh, you know, being out there. I I I think that uh, uh, there has to be a significant policy review uh, at the level of government uh, and the working the central government working with the local government. How do you deal with uh, to enhance uh, opportunities for 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 successful lifestyles for people in, in, in rural communities? I suspect also that uh, what is a is a challenge for rural areas is is more exacerbated there, but also uh, a feature of of lifestyles in the urban areas is a, is a, is a, is our family the family as an institution has has been under tremendous pressure since uh, the, the colonial days of the conquest and the breaking up of families so we have to think about the south african situation and uh, i remember my cousin once visited the university of cape town in we were asking about, ask him about the issue of uh, the link between violence and, uh, and poverty. He said uh, there isn't a necessary link because uh, uh, in India there's a lot of, of poverty, but it doesn't often go with the kind of violence that we see in our own country. So, as, it must mean so there isn't a necessary link, but but uh, uh, what is it therefore that causes so much violence in our particular context? In my view, it, it has a lot to do with almost a uh, hundred years of dislocations of families. Uh, uh, so it seems as if we've got to do something more. And to, to rebuild uh, community lives as well as, as, well as, as uh, family, with the families at, at, at the center of it, so that uh, there is a value system that is shared uh, across the community, which uh, young people uh, uh, are a part of. Uh, I think that uh, the, the lack of a sense of shared social values inside the family, in the community, it spreads out to the rest of the country that your notions of, of, of civility, courtesy, and, and all that uh, disappear over time. And people no longer know how to, to interact with one another when they see each other for the first time. Uh, just give an example. I mean, in, in, in the U.S., uh, people, well, it's a cultural of it. In the U.S., I think people uh, always introduce themselves by their first names. Now, in, in, in our culture, you, you can't call someone you've never met before by their first names. And uh, you go to, to end the first name through the, the last name, because the last name is more status. It's the recognition of status, so you're recognizing the family from which that person comes, not so much the individual. And uh, now, uh, the, American, the American practice of first name is, has, has spread, but it has caused a lot of, of, uh, of stress uh, in societies where you can't call your mother by your first name, or you, you can't call your so if I bring a friend to my family uh, who is American and say, this is my mother, uh, the, the visitor, I can't say, this is my mother, Jane. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's totally not allowed. Uh, so the visitor has got to be using Mrs. Mrs. Cinderella for a while. So it's those, it's those, it's those, it's those. I'm, I'm just using one example of, a, of a, a values and, and civilities that have 
sound has spread across the world, causing a lot of social trauma uh, in countries where, where they, they have no cultural routine, uh, but it become a sort of cool thing, but the cool thing causes, goes with it uh, with a lot of stress. So I, I think we watch a lot of American movies. Uh, we are exposed to uh, American commodities. Uh, you, if you see, a, a, if you see a, a, a young South African uh, walking, looking fashionable through the streets, uh, you might easily think that they are from New York. Uh, but they are not from New York. But when they, go ho when they get home, they, they, they are far from being an American. You know, they have to become, you know, who they are right there. So there's a shift of a, of a, of a sensibility in one person uh, from hour to hour uh, can have, can have a, a severe uh, implications for identity and, and, and how you relate to other people. So, uh, it's, 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 it's a big challenge for, for us. So it's a long, long answer to the issue of the, a long response to, to uh, uh, making a difference in, in rural life. But I think it's part of it, but uh, it's how you create a, a culture, whether it's urban or rural, how, how do you create a culture of, uh, of, of where human beings share certain values, have a lifestyle that they can take care of and bring up their children, uh, transmit important values in their culture, and make sure that uh, there is a long-term stability <coughs> in the community. Thank you. I, I uh, really love the uh, inter-systems approach to um, higher ed, working with government, working with medicine, working with local communities to address those big problems. Uh, and I think that certainly is the way that we're going to need to address um, uh, all of the issues that are plaguing uh, our local communities as well as our, our national landscape. So we've got a few minutes, and we I promised that we would have uh, uh, some time for those of us in the audience that are those of uh, the audience participants to uh, ask you some questions. So we'll open it up a little bit uh, and see uh, what they'd like to hear. Questions? Oh. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Professor. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Shumel Sasafa. I'm a faculty member in this college, a native of Ethiopia. I actually started in South Africa, also for a brief period. <coughs> I know South Africa very well. I studied at the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal mm -hmm. in Durban and Peter Meisner campuses. And uh, I had really a very fond memory. <coughs> this is during my time in 2001. Um, but I think my question really is uh, in terms of sustaining the legacy of Mandela. Um, may his soul rest in peace. After his passing, with Becky, Zuma, and really, I think now we see probably a better <coughs> uh, atmosphere or climate of political stability, I would say. But, you know, I'm going back to that conflict um, just a little bit earlier. Um, what, what is happening in terms of, for example, uh, creating that space for education for the young South Africans? Um, as you probably know, I have to say it, <laughs> South Africa is called the most xenophobic. Um, my native fellow Ethiopians and other African countries are being ransacked and killed all the time in the streets of Johannesburg and in the surrounding environments. Um, I, I think you see this, I'm sure, again and again. Do you see there is any disconnect between, I know there was that empowerment movement, right, to prepare South Africans to be educated 
And this is the result disconnect after the passing of Mandela with the succeeding leaders to transform the societies that Mandela had visioned. Thank you so much. Um, did, you, did you ask it? Was there a question you specifically asked? Or yeah. Was the question you asked? I, I think what, what, what is being done in terms of um, you know, preparing South Africans to be for, for the education system and for the time we live in now, okay. and um, you know, to live in peace and harmony that Mandela envisioned, really. Okay. okay. I think a lot has been done. Um, I think that uh, if you look at uh, let's, let's, let's start with the, the Mandela phase. Remember that uh, there were something like 16 different kinds of educational systems because of the small countries that we created. Well, one of the biggest uh, challenges for the Mandela government was to consolidate everything into one educational system for everyone. Now that was a massive task. For the, for the higher education system, uh, there was a further consolidation where an attempt was made to, to, to bring together uh, universities that have been uh, favored by the past that they should share uh, with the uh, universities that had not been as favored uh, in, in the past in order to create. So there was a, a re-arrangement um, of the higher education system which resulted in what were called uh, research, research institutions that were pretty much left as they were because they've also done a lot to, to change the, the, the transformation, uh, uh, to make the transformation agenda. Then there was another tier that was called Universities of Technology uh, to produce people that could uh, work and uh, be employable uh, in, in technical fields. Uh, there was a lot done as well in the health, health uh, to provide health services uh, to, to universally to people uh, who have no access to, to uh, insurance for, for private hospitals. So there's a big discrepancy in quality between public institutions and, and, and health, in, in, the health, in the health sector. Uh, I think that uh, the, the government has been committed throughout to, to equalizing. Uh, I think the biggest question is the, is the question of resources. One, two, and the ability of the state to control uh, human movement. Uh, the South African borders have become very, very porous. And uh, a lot of people uh, come in from other parts of the, con of the continent. Uh, rightly so, because the, everyone is searching for opportunities. Uh, and uh, the, the, but when, when they get in, and they, then they, uh, in no time, some of them uh, 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 run, run businesses. Uh, uh, they, they, they also uh, uh, compete for the, the health, for the health, it's a lot of resources that get taken away from, from the from the fiscus. It's not it's not anything that anyone wants should happen, but it's a fact. That now you and I can can rationalize the, the situation uh, and, and and provide historical explanations, but but on the ground uh, it translates into into opportunities are being taken away. And unfortunately, there's also research that shows that uh, South Africans don't have to be uh, uh, s s uh, unsettled by this movement of people. 
because they actually bring uh, skills and, and, and experiences and that uh, South Africans don't have. Uh, so for me, the issue is not uh, immigration itself, but how the, the immigration process is handled uh, from at the level of the state and, then, uh, and how that then is translates down to, to other uh, uh, levels of state. I must mention another one. It's, it's about uh, black South Africans have been <coughs> have been deprived of uh, playing a, a, an important role in trade, trade and industry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Canadians, Nigerians, uh, Ethiopians, or Senegalese, uh, 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 Congolese uh, are expert traders. I mean, the trading has been in their culture uh, for a long, long time. So when they get into a place like South Africa, they see opportunities uh, uh, immediately, and they seize them. And uh, uh, the, I suspect that uh, there's a sense of a, of a disempowerment that local uh, Africans may experience, South Africans may experience, uh, uh, as a result of this situation. And I don't think that the, the government is doing enough uh, to, to prepare and educate people on the complexities of uh, demographic shifts in the South African uh, environment. Uh, for me, who has traveled all over the world, uh, I welcome people coming from anywhere to settle in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I wish that there was a mechanism for doing it in, in a way that was not so disruptive and did not allow, did not uh, encourage conflict uh, with, uh, with people that are coming from other from other countries. Uh, after all, uh, I I spent 20 years in Lesotho and was never thought rejected as a refugee or, or whatever. I was a fully fully accepted. The, 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 I think the, the ultimate goal is is how to make South Africa a place for, for everyone. Let me mention also one other thing that the state has done very well. It is that our constitution allows for, for free speech. And it allows for, for people to organize for human rights to be protected. So we have what we call chapter nine institutions, the human rights and uh, the public sector protector and all those things. The, even even foreigners, such as uh, who are, might be the victims of, uh, uh, they they organize protests, mm. and you know, and, and everyone accepts that they, they have a right to to take to, to protest and, and uh, fight for, for for their rights. Uh, and it doesn't happen a lot in, in many other countries. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, there is a problem of that that. He, that uh, we're talking about now, but there's also uh, 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 opportunities for people to to, to, to to grapple with it in a constructive way. That's great, that's great. I think that we are out of time, so I uh, seem to have uh, turned off my microphone, so I'm going to use yours for a moment. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. What a, a great way to start our day. Very inspirational, very insightful. Uh, gives us something to think about as we move forward with our own plans uh, and the way that we engage with our communities. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.